today I want to talk to you about battling complexity in a large software uh, project. And what I want to give you is an understanding of the, the things you can do right now in your projects to avoid uh, a lot of development pain down the road. I come from, I'm from Zagreb, and I'm extremely happy to see so many of you coming uh, to the conference in my hometown. I work as a senior software engineer in uh, TopTel uh, core team. I, I work on the system that uh, powers the entire company. And uh, my daily job is what uh, has inspired me uh, for the topic of this talk, because I spent a lot of time uh, trying to find ways to uh, better control the complexity uh, we have in our system. Uh, TopTal being the uh, largest 100% remote company in the world, uh, I also I have a home office. I work mostly with my dog, uh, who is a very harsh critic. Uh, this is him actually uh, showing his displeasure uh, with a particular slide uh, in an early version of this presentation. Uh, you'll notice that the slide is no longer in the presentation. Uh, now, as much as I would li love to talk for 25 minutes about my dog, and it would probably be a much more interesting conversation, uh, the organizers rejected that proposal, uh, so I have to talk to you about programming. Okay, first thing, uh, can you please raise your hand if the thought of taking over development of a large legacy system is something that gets you excited? Okay, so uh, we have uh, Bruno and Tony, but they are not accountable. So uh, I, I see that uh, <laughs> I don't enjoy that either. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have a creation of a brand new application. And I, I think, without asking the raise of hands, I think probably all of us enjoy starting a new application. And for me, you know, I especially uh, enjoy that because it fills me up with hope. Um, and excitement that this time all of the mistakes I've seen in other code bases and all of the mistakes I have made on one project or another, uh, I will avoid them this time. Uh, it, will be, it will be just amazing. It will be the best project ever. I have it in my head. The architecture is great. Uh, in fact, it will be so great that uh, one day when other programmers see my code, they will spontaneously compose songs in my honor Right, that last one is maybe a bit far-fetched, but a man can dream, a man can dream. Um, but more often than not, what happens is that uh, the project, after you know, a few years, is, is very functional, but maybe not so robust or so pretty. It does the job, uh, but there are certain areas where if you want to have a feature there, somebody will say, do we really need to touch that part of the code base? Uh, it's been working fine for a while. Can we just can we not touch it? And anyway, the developer uh, who developed it is no longer in the company. For some reason, always the developer is no longer in the company. Uh, and you ask yourself, how did we get here? Did we take a wrong turn somewhere? And that is that is what I want to talk about. Um, in some cases, the reason might be, let's say, bad developers. But let's leave that aside. Um, we are here at an IT conference, and I will assume that we are talking about a project where we have responsible developers who did the study, who did the work, who know what they're doing, and they still got a complex project. What follows is an advice, advice uh, that I will give based on my experience first failing to build uh, projects that will stand the test of time. I have my share, you know, we all have to learn. I have my share of projects in which, if I'm being completely honest, if they were any more successful, the code base would fall apart. Uh, but also, on the experience I have working on the current uh, TopTal project, and what we built there, and what worked for us as we grew. And the project is quite large, to give you a sense. It's been developed over six years. I joined the project three years ago. Um, and uh, over that time, 166 developers uh, worked to produce over 65,000 commits. Uh, so that, that gives you a sense of how large it is. And you might ask, in general, how large are the projects that I'm talking about? And I came with two metrics that I think, they're, they're a bit fuzzy, but I think they work. One is that it's impossible to follow 
everything that's being done on the project. So the number of people committing, the amount of commits, pull requests, is so large that if you were to code review every one, you would basically just be code reviewing and your 40 hour work week would not be enough. The other metric is that you cannot fit the project in your head. It's just too large. Uh, in my current project, on a regular basis, uh, even though I've been working on it for three years, I stumble into parts of the code that look completely new to me, that look like I'm going into a new project, because even if maybe I worked on it two years ago, 20, 30 developers committed thousands and thousands of code and deleted thousands and thousands of code. So it's almost as a new project. And also I talk about complexity, um, the complexity that we get. Before I get there, I want to explain what kinds of complexity I'm talking about. And I'm going to divide complexity into two groups. One is domain complexity. So that is the complexity of the problem domain that we are working with, and that is something that we, we cannot change. That is something uh, that is given to us. It is what it is. We have to work with it. The other kind of complexity is system complexity, and that is something that, by being very clever or you know, n not clever enough or too clever, we invented ourselves. We built into the system. And that is something that we definitely can control. We made it, so we can make it better. And the question is, I said, let's assume a good team of developers. But we still end up with complexity in a lot of cases. Uh, how did that happen? There's a, there's a saying that um, I, I think it's very insightful, that the road to hell is paved by good intentions. And I think we can say that the road to complex projects is paved by well-implemented features. The feature in itself is implemented, can be implemented really well. And you may have made some small compromises. The compromises that you did make are, you might even be aware of it, but they're very small. You have to be pragmatic. You need to ship the feature. There's no point in going from 99% to 100%. But the thing is, in a large project, small compromises add up. In a very small project, you might have, you know, you have a few features interacting and there's not much problem. But in a large code base, just because of its sheer size and the number of features in it, the touching points between features can grow numerous. And you get pieces of code which are affected by not one or two compromises. They're affected by 20, 30 compromises. Uh, you're being pragmatic along the way, and every time you look at the feature, you say, well, these one or two compromises are not worth the time. But if you were asked at any point, would you be willing to make 30 compromises on this piece of code here, you'd probably say, no, no, we need to cut it down to two or three. A and that's how, feature by feature, um, you, get, you get the complexity. And I think we can say that large projects act as a magnifying glass for all the trade-offs uh, we make. Uh, I, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to put a quote by a famous engineer, uh, but I couldn't find any that was fitting, so I, I just made up one. I heard on a keynote yesterday that uh, apparently it's okay to quote yourself, uh, so that's great. It makes it much easier to come up with good quotes. Um, okay, so what are the consequences of the complexity that we end up with? Uh, there are many, many consequences. The topic is very large and complex, pun intended, uh, but these three are something that I, I think it's most important and I wanted to cover those. So basically, I'm scratching the surface, surface of the problem, but I think this, these are the most useful ones. And that is that it's, one, it's hard to implement a new feature. The other, it's hard to follow what's going on. So when, when you're asked, if I do this, what will happen in the system, there might be a many, many side effects in a large system. And also, it's hard to improve the architecture. Now, you'll notice that all three points have the word hard in them. But it shouldn't really be hard, because you're implementing a feature. Feature m might have the same description. The ticket has the same description as if you're working it in a small project. And in a small project, it's relatively easy. And suddenly, the project is large, and it has be become hard. It shouldn't be like that. OK, so let's look at them uh, in turn. So first, hard to implement, uh, implement a new feature. Um, I said we make compromises. And usually, the compromises can be uh, seen in the light of 
breaking down certain best practices. Now, I looked up the definition of best practices on Wikipedia, and I found this. Commercial or professional procedures that are accepted or prescribed as being correct or most effective. Um, basically, industry standard. Uh, and I want to propose an alternative definition that is, I th says the same meaning, uh, but it's slightly more suited for, th for what I'm trying to explain. And that is that, uh, so that best practices are an approach to solving a given problem that has empirically been shown to have a high, high chance of success. Sorry. So a best practice becomes a best practice because many different people in many different projects noticed that a same pattern has worked out really well. They tried it and worked out really well. They talked to other people, oh, you're using that as well. And it became common knowledge that on many, many projects that worked. So there's a high chance that it's going to work on an another project, which is why we want to use it. Now, you might ask yourself, software project and chance? We are engineers. We don't take chances. We know what we're doing. We are in control of our, of our environment. We control the development of our project. And to that, uh, I say, I want to, there are many factors that influence the development of a project. There are many ways we can divide them. Well, one way you can look at them, it is factors that are known to you. So you have them in the specifications, in the tickets. And there are factors that are unknown to you. You don't, uh, you don't know them yet, they didn't come up yet, or maybe some of the stakeholders just forgot to tell you, and then remember later, or something happens unexpected on your infrastructure. Many, many factors. And to depict the importance of maximizing your chances, it's, it comes down to proportion. And I wanted to, to drive the message home, I wanted to have a little diagram, so if we say, these are the known factors, then the unknown factors will be something like this. And, and that is why I'm really interested in maximizing the chance of survival of my project. Okay, back to best practices. There are many of them, and um, I, don't, I can't and I don't have time to touch on them. I want to touch on two best practices. One that I often see misunderstood, that affects large projects and one that I see just, it's not so known. <coughs> the first one is, don't repeat yourself, the well-known dry. And the definition says, usual one is that every piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous representation in the system, or alternatively, that uh, every, every part of the code base needs, uh, needs to have just one reason that it will change. And the way I see it interpreted usually is that code that is the same, or nearly the same, is being dried. And we are looking only, usually people are looking only at the code, and they're forgetting the purpose of the code. Um, the trick is to dry only the code, the actual intention of the best practice is to dry only the code that is serving the same purpose, not just looking the same. The code that is semantically the same, not just synthetically. To give you an example, this, uh, the exam you can't put big examples, so it's a bit of a trivial example, but use your imagination. So here we have two lines of code that are doing the exact same calculation. They're adding 10%, but they have different business purposes. One is adding sales tax, the other is uh, adding uh, premium markup. And that is something that should not be dried, because sooner or later, one of those will change. This is a good example. It's doing the same calculation slightly differently, uh, but it's calculating actually the same thing. And that is something that definitely should be changed. The reason why it doesn't cause a problem, a uh, big problem in small projects, first of all, uh, there's little chance of things that are, have different purpose having the same um, code because there's not many things in the project. And also, once you do dry it, one of those changes, there's not too many places that you need to affect. You might actually know off the top of your head exactly where you need to change it. But in a large code base, if you dry it, there's more chance that you'll see two pieces of code that are doing the same thing, uh, but they don't actually have the same purpose. It's, and it happened to be like that just because there's so many things going on in the project that 
one of them happen to look like the other one. And furthermore, once you dry it, uh, six months down the line, you might find that 50 developers made use of the function somewhere, and now you have 300, 400 places that you need to go through, and you need to decouple them so that you can change one of them. And now you have a job of explaining to your project manager why something that you estimated is going to take half a day is going to take the whole week, because you're going to spend five and a half days refactoring because you can ch going de-drying it back. Uh, the practice that I see ignored, the other one I want to talk about, is separating by speed of change. Naturally, different parts of the code base are tied to requirements that change at different speeds. Um, your models, the things that makes up your problem domain, so in Toptal's case, user model, job model, engagement model, timesheet, that is something that doesn't change often. That is something that has usually been defined through many years of usage in the industry. Uh, and it's pretty settled in stone. Uh, what might change fast is you have a, some kind of complex promotion around Christmas where people get you know, something given out. And that will go away in January. That is something that changes fast. And um, that, because they have different speeds of change, they also have different requirements. The slow moving parts, the slow changing parts, are usually the foundation, they're usually the lowest layer. And they need to have a really good interface because there's many layers above it using it. You need to optimize, they need to be super robust, they need to be resilient to change, you need to have the good interface that you can cement. Um, and the fast changing parts, well, they need to change fast. You have much less need to have it thoroughly tested because many Many, there's not many layers above it. Usually it's the last layer is the, the faster changing one. And if you separate them, you can apply different approaches to different things uh, and improve your code base. And also, when you need to change it, you don't have to be that concerned that you're breaking something. Because if you have the fast changing thing together with the slow changing thing, you must change the fast changing thing. And then you need to ensure that anything that depends on it is not broken. If you separate it, you have a much less of a cognitive load. Okay, so that's, that's the, the first group of consequences. The other is hard to figure out exactly what is going on. Uh, and this is something that surprised me. Um, and it happened that somebody, one of the stakeholders asked me, came up on Skype, asked me, hey Radan, so if, I, if we do this, if a client does this, this, and this in the interface, exactly what will happen? So all of the things that will happen. I said, I wanted to give him an exact answer. I didn't want to give it on the top of my head. So I said, give me a second, let me check in the code. So I went in the code, and then I had to come back and say, actually, give me half an hour. I'll come back and explain it. So then I traced it through the code I dug up. I loaded all that functionality in my mind, and I said, okay, so here is what happens. This, this, and this. He asked me a sub-question. Yes, this, this, and this will happen. I had it in my head now. But I had to do the work, and it, it might be harder or easier. And I think a lot of it comes down to uh, naming things. Uh, we know that you know, there are only two, things, two hard things in computer science, naming things and cache and validation. And I think it's extremely important uh, that the things are named as they are by the names that are coming from the problem domain. Uh, in fact, I think it's so important that my next point is exactly the same. When you, if you use the names from the business domain, first of all, you need to understand the business domain. Secondly, when a ticket comes in from a stakeholder, the ticket will use the long language of the stakeholders, the language of the problem domain. And, and if you'll need to then, your part of your job will be to figure out how to implement it. You need to map the requirements in the ticket to your code base. And if you need to understand the requirements, and then you also need to translate that to the language of the code base, you're losing a lot of cognitive ability. You can make mistakes along the way. And it also makes it easier for new people joining the project. As they're talking to uh, stakeholders, they can more easily find uh, what's relevant. If needed, maintain a glossary. I, I think actually, especially if it's a more complex domain, you should maintain a glossary so that new people joining the project, they can go through the glossary, get familiar with the problem domain. And then when they look into the code base, they're immediately understanding, oh, this class is for this, this class is for that. And it feeds into the fact that on large projects, you need to optimize for discovery. 
Uh, on our main project, I rarely use the tree view in the editor on the side. Um, it's, it's completely useless. There's just too many things there. What I do, I open fuzzy search, and then I guess. I guess where it might be. I put in some keys, and I guess where the cla what class might be relevant. And a good indicator of a well-organized code base is that when you guess, you guess correctly. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that in, in our code base, quite often I can, I can guess where it is. If not, I need to take maybe a few tries. If something takes a lot of time to find, then that's a problem. It needs to be improved. And on the point of guessing, what helps a lot is the best practice of single responsibility principle. Swiss Army knives are awesome. I love them. You, having them with you is it's very, very useful, but not in a professional setting. Uh, you wouldn't, if you go with your car to a mechanic, and on the table he just has a bunch of Swiss Army knives, you would not be very happy. You would go to a different mechanic. You expect him to have a set of very specialized tools. And in the code base, you often need to find where some, some tool, you have the tools in terms of utility classes or some other classes, and you need to find the one you need. And often, because there's so many of those, your first pass in finding it, again, you're guessing. You're looking at the class names and saying, trying to pick out the most likely candidate because you can't go and open each one because you will spend next hour trying to find it. So you're looking at the class names and you're trying to make the best guess. You open the class, is it here? No, you go next time, is it here? And if a class has many responsibilities, you won't be first, you won't be able to name it so that it reflects it well. So you won't be able to guess. Uh, so you might be going around looking at the class and just missing it. If all of them are very focused, it's much, much easier uh, to find what you're looking for. Okay, so we're now at the last thing. It's uh, hard to improve your architecture. Uh, it's important because your requirements will change or you will gain new insight. And we, you, will, you will need to change the architecture. And there's often a view that if a code base is mature and large, what you have, that's it. You can't really go around with a hammer deconstructing it. And I think that mostly comes from um, uh, from buildings, uh, engineering in the real world, where you really can't do that. But we are software engineers. Uh, we can do anything. It's soft. Uh, we can do refactoring, and when it's done at a large scale, uh, I think uh, large-scale refactoring is a fitting name. So some of the examples, you might need to rename some entity that's being used in thousands and thousands of places. Um, because the business names could change, or you find a better name, or some something that's being used in many places. Uh, you found out a new, a new way to do things that is superior to the old way, and you want to apply it. You realize you, you, were at, you read the blog somewhere, an amazing blog that opens your eyes, and you realize if we knew this a year ago, the code base would be so much better. And uh, for example, you might find that a feature has evolved to fit better in a different system. Everybody, all the new developers, when they come, they go looking for it there, and then you have to tell them, no, it's in the other place because of legacy reasons. Just don't ask, just leave it there. Um, and you, you will not want to do that. Um, some of the reasons most common is there is no time. Well, if there's no time to, uh, to make the, uh, the code base improve it, there will be no time. Uh, there will be no time to add a feature as well. It will eat up the time in your feature development. And refactoring is a one-off cost, and the cost you pay every time you add feature is perpetual. For as long as the project exists, you're going to be paying that. So eventually, you're going to catch up with the cost of refactoring. So unless you plan on going back bankrupt soon, you probably should refactor. Um, it's too risky. And again, risky to refactor also means it's risky to add a feature. When you add a feature, you're changing something, so you could break something. Um, and you should, this is a point where you actually have to sell it hard, probably, to management. And the way to sell it is to, say, treat it as an investment. We give me two weeks now to improve this, and we will save two months over every two years of development in the future, or something like that. You, you'll be making up the number anyway, but 
<laughs> when you do estimates, you make up the number anyway. They seem to be okay with that, so <laughs> just go with it. And you might also say that the current state is okay. And to that I say, see all of the above. Um, it's not okay. That, that's why you're talking about it. And it's not actually that hard. First, get to high test coverage. Uh, if you don't have high test coverage, I don't know, run for the hills, change jobs, uh, g change projects. Um, you, need, uh, you need high test coverage. You need the safety net of tests. So if you don't have, first build up your test coverage so that if you break something, you know that something will break. If you have very, very poor test coverage, start with integration tests. Just bring up integration tests that are going through a large amount of functionality. Uh, you're not at a stage where you can have pinpointing tests, but you, you can definitely have safety nets so that you just, at least you'll know that you can't merge this and you can't deploy it. Uh, pick a time when you can have as few distractions as possible. You'll need to have high concentration. If needed, uh, agree with your colleagues in the team to cover you, basically. You will you know, take, a fake, take a fake vacation where they will cover you for a week, all of your duties, and you will just focus on refactoring that so that you can emerge on the other end uh, victorious and everybody's uh, happier. It starts by exploring the code base. You're loading it into your mind. You're, you're, you're loading it into your working memory, so that you have an understanding as if it's a small project. You're looking at a slice of a large project, but you're getting to a point where that slice feels to you like a small project. You know it inside out, and uh, and find breaking points and try to ship in minimal increments. All of this is important if you're at least a little optimistic about your project. If you think it's going to fall apart, then ignore it. And um, I, the main takeaways here is please pay attention to things you can do early that will pay off later. Invest in your code. And keep yourself a happy developer so that you can make your stakeholders happier by shipping more features with less bugs. Thank you.